Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to those here and also to those who are online with us today. Who is welcome here at TLC? Whatever color, nationality, or race, whatever language, wherever you were born, whatever your immigration status. <laughs> if you are three days old, 30 years old, or 103, whatever your age, welcome. Whatever faith, or wherever you are in your faith journey, even if you have never stepped foot in a church before, welcome. If you are single, married, widowed, divorced, separated, or partnered, whatever your relationship status. Welcome. If you are fully able, disabled, or of differing abilities. Welcome. Whatever addictions, phobias, regrets, whatever burdens, whatever brokenness. Welcome. Whatever your sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. You are, you are welcome, welcome here at TLC. Here we reject racism, misogyny, homophobia, and transphobia, and actively work to dismantle them. We acknowledge and reject the strains of white supremacy embedded in governments, institutions, individuals, and public and private speech. We reject using the Bible to abuse and wound. We confess our own complicity. We commit to lives of repentance and reconciliation, of justice and mercy, to love God by loving our neighbor in both words and deeds. Amen. <clears throat> Verses 1 to 11. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but we have, not, we have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. 
And the king filled both bowls so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zenity, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought the boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. He ran to read. Grace, peace, and ooh, hello. Grace, peace, and mercy be unto you from God our Father and His Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So, the, throughout the, the fall and winter months, we're focusing as a congregation in the Gospel of Luke on stories of encounters with Jesus. Stories of encounters with Jesus. Because let's face it, when someone encounters Jesus, they don't leave that encounter unchanged, do they? If anyone encounters Jesus one way or the other, they're going to leave that encounter changed, touched, transformed, different. For an encounter with Jesus cannot but help but leave us changed. The Lord's calling. The Lord called to Simon and James and John and all of the disciples. The Lord called to Moses, right? The Lord called to Abraham, Paul, Stephen, many, many others. The Lord has called to each one of us. In our baptism, the Lord has called to us. And as one of my pastoral colleagues likes to say, in baptism, the Lord gives us all a job. The Lord calls to us, just like he called to Simon on the boat, come follow me. The Lord calls to us to lives of discipleship. The Lord asks us to drop our metaphorical fishnets, to leave our metaphorical boats, and follow Him. Jesus calls us into lives of discipleship. So what's a disciple? A disciple is a follower, and a disciple of Jesus then would be a follower of Jesus. Disciple is one who follows, so a disciple of Jesus is one who follows Jesus. And a follower of Jesus is called to a life. Now listen, right? A disciple of Jesus is called to a life born of absolute trust and complete surrender. A disciple of Jesus is called to a life of absolute trust and complete surrender. What does absolute trust look like? In the First Testament, the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, in the book of Daniel, now we know Daniel, you know, if we were raised anywhere near the church as kids, what's, what's the story about Daniel? Lion's death. But there's, there's some other stuff that happens in the book of Daniel. There's these three characters, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And in the book of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar, say that five times fast, King Nebuchadnezzar had had statues of himself placed throughout the empire 
And when the instrument sounded, everyone was supposed to pay homage to the statue of King Nebuchadnezzar. But the Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused and refused. And so they were arrested. They were caught up. They were brought to a place where there was a fiery furnace. And they were told that unless when the instrument sounded, they were willing to bow down and pay homage to the statue, that they were going to be placed in the fiery furnace and burned utterly. What does absolute trust look like? Well, this is what happened. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter if our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Absolute trust. Trust is a faith that takes a stand when life turns perilous and there's no guarantee of immediate deliverance. When life turns perilous and there's no guarantee of immediate deliverance, and one stands fast in the faith. That's absolute trust. A disciple of Jesus trusts in Jesus absolutely, except when they don't. And I'll be the first to tell you, I struggle with absolute trust. Now, I'm not going to take a poll here this morning, but I'm certain that I'm not alone. Trust and doubt, doubt and trust, our doubt puts us in good company. When the disciples heard from the women that Jesus had been raised from the dead, not all the disciples believed the good news. Trust and doubt, doubt and trust. Thomas doubted when Jesus ascended into heaven. Some of the disciples believed, trusted in what their eyes were telling them, connecting with what they were seeing, with what Jesus told them. And some doubted. Trust and doubt doubt and trust. The original disciples arguing over which one was the greatest. Was that an expression of their absolute trust in Jesus? The original disciples crying out to Jesus that they had left everything to follow him wanting to know that what they were going to get out of the relationship. Was that an act of absolute trust? No. Trust doesn't come with a snap of a finger. Trust doesn't come from one really good kick-butt Sunday either. If absolute trust in God was so easy, it wouldn't be so hard. A disciple of Jesus lives a life of absolute trust, except when they don't. But a disciple also lives a life of complete surrender. And what does complete surrender look like? Sneak ahead in Luke. We're in the fifth chapter now. If we flip ahead to 22, 
Jesus. It's the Monday, Thursday evening after the Last Supper. He goes out to the Mount of Olives, and a couple of disciples are invited to follow him, and he reaches the place. If you've ever come from the Northeast, every other church has this painting behind the altar of Jesus. There's a big old rock and Jesus is kneeling at the big old rock and the sky is dark and Jesus' hands are folded in prayer and his eyes are uplifted to heaven. He looks at the disciples and says, pray you may not come into the time of trial. And then he prays to God after moving to that rock a little further away and says, Father, if you are willing, Remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me, but, but not my will, but yours be done. That's complete surrender. Not my will, but yours be done. But more often than not, we wrestle between our will and God's will. We pretend that God's will is our will because that makes it easy. What we really want to do is to substitute our will for God's will, God liking what we like, God hating what we hate. Complete surrender becomes anything but becoming just the living of our lives the way we always have unchanged. It's more often than not what we turn complete surrender into. But we've encountered Jesus, you and I, and encounters cannot help but leave us unchanged no matter how much we don't want to change. A disciple of Jesus is a follower of Jesus who exemplifies a life born of absolute trust and complete surrender. But as we are, you and I, typically, most of us, a hot mess of a disciple on our best days, then where does that leave us? It leaves us in the arms of Jesus, right? We're a, a hot mess of a disciple on our best days, and where does that leave us? It leaves us in the arms of Jesus, deep in his embrace. That's where it leaves us, deep in his embrace of grace. And yes, I know that one. But that's where it leaves us, deep in the embrace of Jesus' grace. We want to scream out in frustration that this whole discipleship gig, born of trust and complete surrender, is impossible, impossibly hard, confusing as heck, frustrating as navigating rush hour in downtown Miami times a hundred. On the day of a heat playoff game. <laughs> but it leaves us, as we cry out, deep in the arms of Jesus. Deep in his embrace of grace. Am I a better disciple today than I was yesterday, the day before, or any of us, maybe? I have a hard time imagining that my journey of discipleship is a straight line. Straight line. Okay? When I when I really think, when I'm honest with myself, right, and I think about my journey of growth as a disciple of Jesus, it's not it's not a straight line. Do you remember the family circus cartoon? Billy, the little kid, right? It's like 
when Billy, you know, some Sundays when they post that and, and, and Billy's at the door and he's a lot later than he's supposed to be and his mom's standing there and it's like, Billy, where have you been? And Billy just answers, I just come home from the bus stop. And they show you that dotted line, right? And it's circled around everything, gone over everything and under everything, twice around. <coughs> That's my life of discipleship. It's not a straight line. Tomorrow is not going to make me a better disciple than today, maybe. It's all over the place. It's just how it goes. When Jesus asked Simon, James, John, Andrew, all those folks, drop their nets and follow him, when they do so, that's an act of discipleship. And their journey wasn't a straight line either. It wasn't smooth. Nor was their faith exemplary, far from it. But Jesus doesn't embrace us with his grace because of our potential. He loves us because at the core of his being, God is love. Jesus doesn't love us because we'll be better disciples tomorrow than we were yesterday. Jesus loves us because God, at the core of God's being, is love. That love is going to shape that journey, even if it looks a lot more like the family circus right, than it does a line that keeps sloping. And that love of God for us in Christ Jesus. Deep in God's embrace of grace. That is going to shape our journey with moments, with acts of love and mercy and kindness and forgiveness and repentance. Acts of grace on our own part. Grace upon grace. And every act, every encounter, every moment becomes a moment of possibility of drawing us deeper and higher into the love of God that's going to change and transform us because every encounter cannot leave us the way we were. Discipleship is moment by moment in the embrace of God's grace transforming us through God's mercy and love that we may become instruments of God's mercy and love for the sake of the world when we stood up, and this last week was the 22nd anniversary of my ordination, which gives me time to ponder and look back over not just the 22 years as a pastor, but my whole life of faith does that, you know, these milestones. You look back over my life, folks, and, and, and when we look back over our journey, I don't know about you, but I'm one of those people when I look back over my journey of faith, I don't, I, I'm not magnetically attracted to the highs. I tend to be attracted to the lows and all the things I've done wrong because that's just the way I'm wired. I like to beat myself up over all the wrong choices, the people I've, I've offended, people I've hurt, the, all those things. It's just the way I'm wired. Unfortunately, but just is. But the thing of it is that what keeps drawing me back 
what, what saves me from that kind of despair of all the times I am sure I've convinced myself that I've disappointed God. And maybe, maybe you've had some of those moments too. Right? You think back, oh God, I don't know why God even bothered me. But what, 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 it's God grabs me by the collar and pulls me out of this sort of discipleship pity party, if you will, and reminds me that God doesn't love me any less because of the mistakes I've lived, I've lived right? God loves me because God is love. And God loves you because God is love. And God's called me to be a disciple, and God's called you to be a disciple because that journey of experiencing God as love will continue to transform us and change us and fill us with that love until that love overflows and reaches out and touches other people's lives. And the journey never ends. We don't get to some discipleship nirvana, Valhalla, end of the journey. In this life. But it's the joy of the journey. Of being loved by God and being the love of God for the sake of the world. That should just put us, just, just break us open with joy when we think about it. Amen. 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 <clears throat> I know it says sharing the thankfulness, but since our theme these weeks and months is encounters with Jesus, I wanted to ask the question, where have you encountered Jesus this past week? If these encounters with Jesus impact our lives and leave us changed, or encounters where we've experienced mercy, forgiveness, hope, love, Kindness, grace. Where have you encountered Jesus this week? These moments of mercy, thankfulness, love, compassion, forgiveness, love, abundance. A little harder question, but it gets us thinking more deeply we go through these stories Sunday by Sunday of all these people who encountered Jesus. Simon Peter encounters Jesus in today's story. He drops his fish nets. He 
Father. Where, where have you encountered Jesus this week? Maybe through the experiences you have with others. I have one. Um, where I work at Hollywood Golf and Tennis, it's a 55 and older, it's a 55 and older um, actor driven community. Anyway, word get around, gets around that um, our church is very loving and giving toward people who have very little or nothing. And anyway, people have been giving, um, and this week, three people bought bags of clothing in, and one um, person, um, I mean, his, a truck, the, she asked for a truck, and the truck went to Danny, and and people and went over to our apartment and bought some stuff to the church here and and there's even more stuff uh, she gave me her key so <laughs> we could go into her apartment and take more stuff <coughs> for people that need it so that's just uh, generosity and, and love for fellow human beings so, and it's good stuff okay <laughs> thanks the stuff of jesus all right I had someone hurt my feelings this week and I was very angry about it and I wanted to lash out. And through the wise counsel of family and friends, I was reminded that forgiveness is what Jesus asks us to do. And today I'm feeling compassion for that person and the peace that forgiveness brings. to be very blessed to be able to spend a day with my daughter, oldest daughter's birthday, and I'm thankful to God that I'm able to spend it and enjoy it and just be able to interact with her on her birthday. And I love her so much and I want her to know that I love her. And I thank the Lord for blessing her in my life. Happy birthday! Happy birthday. Yay, I'm glad you were born. And it's Janine's birthday today, too. Happy birthday. <laughs> right, your sister from another mother. Uh, anyone else? And she got into steps. So I saw Jesus come in two places, in two persons, in one place, uh, just this past Wednesday. So I have a really good friend, and she will go to the ends of the earth for anything that this church will give. She took a day off of work, personal day, vacation day, went there and helped with the food pantry. And at that food pantry, we had the most beautiful, loving woman who was so humbled by everything that Miss Danny has done. She <coughs> said, I would not let anything else do with her last day. I would not let her sit on the seat of work. She was putting her food pants. So, thank you, Miss Danny. I've seen Jesus in you. still there and I mean I turned around just to ask a question to the person about someone that I was looking for and the person that I asked the question was a cousin that I hadn't seen in 44 years not because uh, I just asked him about someone that, that, that I knew and the person that I asked him about was his uncle and uh, and uh, when recognized him when I saw his name uh, it was just like this is just this this is uh, uh, something that just doesn't happen and uh, I was very 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 grateful and uh, and I know it was all God so thank you 
Thanks, sister. Encounters, that's what Jesus. And every encounter leaves us changed. My friends, let's take a moment now. And if you look in your your worship folders there, you'll see the Apostles' Creed, the early statement of faith in the church, the creed uh, on our baptism. We confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
but from respect. May our strength come not from violence, but from love. May our wealth come not from money, but from sharing. May our path be not one of ambition, but of justice. May our victories not be one of revenge, but of forgiveness. Our armed and confident, help us to defend the dignity of all creation. Sharing today and always the bread of solidarity in our midst. Amen. Father God, we come to you this morning in prayer for Sam C. having knee surgery. Ted, for his upcoming surgery, Lord, we pray. Pearl Williams, who's having health problems. Jim and his knee pain. Rick, for ongoing health issues. The Azar family. Continue prayer for Sue, who's dealing with chemo. Healing for Ian from his brain surgery. Father God, into your hands we pray these things. Father, we also pray for Paula and her family, family in UK, for Joe, for Jody, for Gina, for Carol and Carolyn, for John and Jason, Ruth and Casey. We continue to pray for Ashley, Tristan. Chris, Kristen, and thank you for the for the, for the family and of glory and their generosity. Father God, we continue to pray for our Muslim brothers and sisters. We pray for the Vega family, the Payne family, the Salisbury family, Diane, David, Roger, Carol, Eileen, and Pam. We continue to pray for Ms. Bev, Jose, and the Trinity family, and the people of Puerto Rico. Father, we pray for peace of the world, for Cassidy, Logan, Katie, and Allison. We pray for thee and all widows as they mourn their loss. Continue prayer for Susie and Ann, and for Vinny and his new life. And Father, I continue to pray for all of my family and my friends and my loving sister who came to visit me for my birthday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My friends, the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us share that peace with one another.
betraying our Lord Jesus, took bread, gave thanks, broke it, given for all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me.
just see one of uh, those folks in Illinois and pr pronounce God's prayer of blessing, free healing over you. That's your choice as you go back to your pew. Let us then uh, continue as we commune with our, our assistants and with the folks uh, who are worshiping through the, um, the live stream. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. <laughs> blood of Christ shed for you, the blood of Christ shed for you, the blood of Christ shed for you.
us with the holy body and blood of your Son, by your Holy Spirit, enliven us to be his body in the world, that more and more we will give you praise and serve your earth and its many peoples, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Two announcements. One, it's pouring out, so the Lord wants you all to go to coffee hour. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to greet at the side door because there's no point in greeting you out into the storm. So next door, we got coffee hour going. So today is the day that we uh, pack up cookies and write notes of encouragement for our young adults. Well, they're not, they're all of our young adults. So there's a few things. This began as college cookies years ago. When we did little college cookie care packages. But then a couple of things changed. One is, not every young adult is going to college, right? And that's okay. And we're not trying to elevate some young people over other young people and create these kind of false equivalence thingies. So, so what we did was we said, you know, any young adult, in college, out of college, home, away, working, not working. And we kind of targeted that 18 to 25. But we're a grace-filled Lutheran people. And so if there are folks, you know, on either side of that 18 to 25 who a blessing of cookies is going to bless, we're okay with that too. So what we do is we pack up, we, we put out the word through the, the congregation and on social media. And so... The other thing that we did was originally we were just sending college cookies to Trinity College people. So now we send young adult cookies to anybody. And the notes that we get back from people who are loosely associated with the congregation are not associated at all, but who recognize that there are young people in their lives for whom this would be a gift of grace, shows us that what we're that we're on to doing something more faithfully than we've done it before. Mm -hmm. And so, the, so know when you see the names on the list to either write a note, know that these people may be in school, they may be out of school, they may be working, they may not be working, they may be associated closely with this congregation or may be complete strangers. So know that. Uh, we have tons of note cards or donated cards we have lists of names, and we invite you to write just a word of encouragement and put their 
some identifying name on the envelope or on the card so that we get it in the right box. So we need people writing cards and then we need people, pack, we have like a cookie table and zip box and if the people are local, we're just putting them in zip locks with the cards. If they are uh, living in Florida, then we, we have shoe boxes and butcher paper to cover the shoe boxes. Because if we mail them that way, it's cheaper. If we use the pre-priced USPS boxes, which we have outside of Florida, it's cheaper. We're experts at this. We've learned. <laughs> so we kind of have that all set up. So if you'd like to be a, a bagger or a boxer or a note writer, all those things would be totally awesome while you wait for the rain to change and you eat coffee hour stuff and know that in some small way that you're, you're being Jesus for people by, by helping be a blessing for them. Uh, whatever they are in their life circumstances. That's a really long announcement. You get all that? Yeah. Nice. Yes. <laughs> Let us rise. <laughs> Siblings in Christ, let us go out into the world as wet as it is, in peace. <clears throat> let us love boldly, proclaim loudly, welcome, include, celebrate, our black, brown, and indigenous people of color and LGBTQIA plus siblings especially. Why? Because those are the folks who have been the victims of less mercy, less understanding, and lots of judgment. So that's why in our closing we call them out because we know that for generations going back that these folks in particular have suffered injustices and we as a faith community recognize that and are trying to create a, a more merciful and helpful and loving narrative in their lives for the relationship with Christians. Yes? Yes, yes. 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 I could have asked with that and explained it all at the bottom of the page, but hey, there you go. Say it out. Let us enter back into this space knowing that welcome is a priority in this church. We're going to stand strong against injustice of the world and let this faith community be a place of care and renewal as people of God. We are called to action. Beloved, we we'll go in peace, work for justice, encounter God in all you see, and know that you are loved. Thanks, be to God. Thanks be to God.